Welcome to another episode of Reliability Matters. This is our fourth episode. In our first episode, we featured an interview with SMT guru Bob Willis. In episode two, we spoke with failure analysis investigators Eric Camden and Paco Solis about their experiences solving reliability issues in the field. In episode three, we spoke with Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Laboratories engineer Wendy Kasker about her successful effort to switch their space customers' cleaning process from a solvent base to an aqueous base, improving cleanliness, safety, and environmental impact. Coming up, we have several terrific interviews with very interesting individuals, including ITM Consulting's Phil Zaro and Jim Hall. You're going to get a kick out of these guys. Soon also, we'll be speaking with Rockwell Collins, now Collins Aerospace, Doug Pauls, discussing the new IPC J Standard 001 G Amendment 1 and the new cleanliness assessment requirements for objective evidence. What does that mean for you? We'll be discussing that soon, so stay tuned. On this fourth episode, I thought it would be a good idea to review the contents of a recent webinar we released last week. The title of the webinar is Improving Reliability of Circuit Assemblies in Harsh Environments. Here's the podcast version of the webinar. If you prefer webinar slides that you can actually see, you can visit aqueoustech.com, click on the Tech Tuesday link. Otherwise, if you prefer to hear the podcast version, then sit down, relax, get comfortable, and we'll begin right now. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. All right, here, we're going to get started. Uh, Once upon a time, we cleaned all circuit assemblies, and that is just a fact. And the the times when we cleaned pretty much every circuit assembly uh, was prior to 1989. There's a line in the sand in the electronics assembly industry, and that was everything before 1989 and everything after 1989. So what happened in 1989? The U.S. and originally 11 other countries, now every United Nations member country, uh, ratified the Montreal Protocol, which was a treaty to ban certain chlorinated fluorocarbons, CFCs, or chemicals containing CFCs. The number one method of cleaning circuit assemblies uh, prior to 1989 uh, was through uh, solvents, uh, tri- 111 trichloroethane, Freon TMS, and a bunch of generic versions of those, uh, almost all of them containing CFCs, which were going to be uh, on a 10-year phase-out by 1999. So that created a dilemma. Um, the industry needed to clean their boards if they were going to continue to use the fluxes and, and soon to Uh, be derived solder paste that they have been using. Um, But of course, uh, necessity is the mother of invention and out came so-called no clean flux. No clean promised um, a elimination of a complete process step. And that would be to eliminate cleaning altogether by using a a flux that uh, did not require cleaning. It was fairly inert uh, and it could, it's, minor residues could stay on the board and not harm them. And if you were in the military business or space electronics or medical electronics, uh, you kept cleaning. You just switched to a a different type of flux and you just kept cleaning or you used the same type of flux and changed your cleaning process either way. Uh, But for the vast majority of assemblers, uh, which is consumer grade electronics, which represent the majority of electronics produced today and then, uh, you just got rid of the cleaning process and switched to no clean flux. So what happened when we stopped removing flux? What happened when we stopped removing flux is we stopped removing everything. And I'm going to make that a bolder statement. We stopped removing everything. And if I can detract for just a moment and get a little bit opinionated, I try not to be too opinionated in these things because I'm no, uh, you know, I, no one died and left me in charge. Um, but, Instead of referring to a defluxing process, um, rethink that. You know, we buy a defluxing machine, we fill it with defluxing chemical, and we run a defluxing process. I would suggest that we take that mindset and modify it slightly and just consider it a cleaning process because the flux is only one of the ingredients we're trying to remove, one of the contaminant species we're trying to remove. 
and while I'm still on an opinion roll, get the word no clean out of your head. Uh, no clean, people read no clean on a label as an instruction rather than um, uh, an adjective. It, it, it really is um, not no clean. It really is low residue. It could be no clean if, if, you can leave, if your board can tolerate that low residue, uh, but it's not always no clean. So consider if you're running a, quote, no clean flux, consider it that it's really just a low residue flux which may be able to be left on the assembly and may not be able to be left on the assembly. So when we're removing flux, when we're running the quote-unquote defluxing process, which I prefer to call a cleaning process, uh, obviously our target is flux. Uh, but there are also a host of what I like to call usual suspect residues on the assembly. And they come from the assembly process itself. They come from humans who touch the boards. They come from the component uh, fabrication part of the business, and they come from board fabrication. Boards have a host of contaminant species on them when you get them before you even populate them. From a board fabrication standpoint, there are etch residues, developer chemicals, water quality uh, rinses for the inner layers and the outer layers, hassle fluids and final rinses, uh, alkaline cleaners are frequently used, and they could leave residues behind. On the component fabrication front, there are plating bath residues, water quality rinses, deflashing chemicals, mold release agents, uh, pre-plating oxide cleaning uh, is done uh, on the uh, on the components and may leave residues, pre-tinning flux residues. A lot of components now are re-tinned to go back to lead if it's like a military application and they can leave residues behind as well. Several years ago at the IPC SMTA cleaning and coating conference in Chicago, which happens every two years, it just happened a few months ago. Um, research in motion, uh, the uh, BlackBerry folks showed up and talked about a issue they had that required cleaning to solve the issue. Now, if you are a phone manufacturer, a mobile phone manufacturer, you have a huge economy of scale and you can afford to tweak your process to avoid certain process steps, uh, and, and capitalize on the, on the sheer scale of your assembly process. They had an issue. They didn't clean their boards. Most cell phone companies don't. Um, again, because they have this huge economy of scale, they're able to control uh, a process and, and choose materials that might avoid the need for cleaning and then save millions of dollars in the process. Um, but BlackBerry had to clean, they had to rescue clean a whole bunch of components. It turned out they had a particular component that would not wet to the board. It was, it was repelling the solder. And upon investigation, uh, they determined that there was mold release on the component reels and the mold release transferred to the board. And if you really want to mess up someone's day, put a little silicone um, around a solder joint and and watch the solder repel from it. Um, so they had to rescue clean a whole bunch of components in order to solder them properly to the board. Just an example of of stowaway residues from other processes. And then we have the assembly process. That's where we intentionally put contaminant species on the board in the form of flux um, and uh, cleaning chemicals. And if they are, uh, parts of them are cleaned earlier in the process. Um, all sorts of contaminant species are intentionally added during and unintentionally added during the assembly process. Then we have the human contaminants. Uh, I like to call it the Dorito effect. Uh, after breaks and after lunch, somehow boards get dirtier. Uh, we tend to put um, we tend to put moisturizers and hand sanitizers uh, on our body, on our hands, and then touch the boards because we're not always wearing finger cuts, and that transfers to the board as well and can affect reliability in the future. So flux is really just the icing on the cake. It sits above human residues, assembly residues, component fabrication residues, and board fabrication residues. One of the problems that we have, one of the great achievements that we've made in the electronic assembly business is miniaturization. We now have you know supercomputers in our back pocket. Um, and in order to do that, we miniaturize the board so they can fit in small packages. We miniaturize the components so we can put many of them within that small package. Uh, and we have now effectively decreased the gap between anodes and cathodes. Um, the, the bridge between, the dielectric properties between uh, conducting uh, uh, forces is minimized to the point where there is very little visible dielectric 
real estate on the board uh, that allows proper resistivity between uh, polar opposites. So when we take our boards and then we fill them with residue, which we always have historically, we've just used to clean it. Um, we have uh, all these different forms of usual suspect residues on the assembly and a very small space that all this residue is crammed into. We're just creating a breeding ground for dendritic growth and parasitic leakage and other forms of electrochemical migration, which we'll get into in a, in a moment. Electrochemical migration does not occur the moment the contaminants are put on the board. It takes time, and that time could be months or sometimes even years before uh, electrochemical migration could manifest into a failure mechanism. So let's talk about electrochemical migration Electrochemical migration is the process of laying conductive materials over insulating materials, resulting in a reduction of resistivity or, in its most dramatic sense, electrical shorts. So ECM starts with, in its worst case, an electrical short, which causes a component to fail or a part of the, the board circuitry to overheat, which can lead and does lead to um, dramatic situations like, like this, like a fire. And of course, circuit boards are usually inside something. So whatever they, whatever device is containing them, uh, shares in the, in the drama, in the drama and, um, can result in a catastrophic failure. There are several types of ECM failure mechanisms. Um, I'll describe what they are and then we'll go into them in a little bit more detail. Uh, ECM failure mechanisms include dendritic growth. That's the one that produces the drama. Dendrite is a word from uh, the Greek um, uh, dendron, which means tree, or dendrites, which means tree-like. Um, obviously, dendrites and dendrite uh, are very similar in, in spelling and pronunciation, uh, and uh, that's where the name dendrite came from. It does resemble the, the branches, the stalk and the branches of a, of a tree, only these are metal branches and metal uh, stumps, and they are conductive. Another type of ECM failure mechanism is parasitic leakage. Uh, we'll get into that in just a moment. And then another type of uh, ECM failure mechanism is CAF, conductive anodic filament. Uh, I like to call it CAF with two F, C-A-F-F, -F, because it almost always ends in failure. So conductive anod anodic filament failure. So it takes three factors. There are three ingredients to produce the possibility of electrochemical migration. They are electrical current, conductive residues, and moisture. Absent any one of these, no ECM. Um, these three factors in the right combination, ECM will follow. Harsh environments affects the amount of conductive residue and moisture required to develop into an ECM uh, mechanism. So the harsher the environment, the less conductive material and actually the less electrical current um, to produce a, a failure mechanism related to electrochemical migration. So we're going to talk a little bit about harsh environments in this case in just a little bit. So of the three... ECM-related failure mechanisms, dendritic growth, parasitic leakage, and CAF, we'll start with dendritic growth. Uh, that is the one that is most common to assemblers' uh, experiences and uh, certainly is the most dramatic. First, let's knock something out of the park here. Is dendritic growth the same thing as tin whiskers? I get asked this everywhere I go, and the answer is no. Completely different phenomenons. Metal whiskers differ from metallic dendrites in several respects. Dendrites are fern-shaped, and they grow across the surface of the metal, while metal whiskers are hair-like and project perpendicularly to the surface. Dendrites require uh, moisture capable of dissolving the metal into a solution of metal ions, which are then redistributed by electromigration in the presence of an electromagnetic uh, field. Tin whisker formation doesn't require any dilution of metal, or the presence of an electromagnetic field. So the pictures that you see uh, below are illustrations of, or photographs of tin whiskers. Uh, compare that to dendritic growth. Um, dendrites um, are completely different. Uh, although they can produce a similar failure mechanism, uh, a short, they are different in, in how they form and the requirements to form them. As I said earlier, it takes three factors to produce an ECM 
a failure mechanism, um, including dendritic growth, and that would be electrical current, which your customers gladly provide the moment they turn the switch on. It requires conductive uh, materials, ionic materials, which can be the residues from flux and can also be um, the usual suspect residues. And normally it is the totality of them both. Uh, it also requires moisture. And when I say moisture, I don't mean a board floating in the ballast of a, a of a ship or a submarine uh, or in you know down an oil well in Houston. It can just be uh, humidity uh, from the uh, atmosphere. Parasitic leakage is um, is a devil. It really is. A parasitic leakage is a a reduction of resistivity, not enough to create a short but enough to alter the performance of the assembly. So parasitic leakage, its most common uh, symptom is it drains the battery on a board. If your assembly is uh, backed up by a battery or operated by a battery or some kind of remote power source that's temporary, um, the parasitic leakage will uh, frequently result in rapid battery drain, um, among other things. But the problem, the good thing and the bad thing is uh, it's only temporary. It's only a temporary problem. Unlike dendritic growth, which creates shorts, which is a more of a permanent uh, damage, uh, parasitic leakage is a temporary phenomenon. It only occurs when the conditions uh, are perfect. So, for example, in a higher uh, humidity environment or an environment that uh, contains quite a bit of moisture, like like this uh, platform here in 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 uh, off the Gulf. Uh, any electronic assembly within that environment is going to be subjected to more moisture uh, and more harsh environment uh, salts and things like that than a board in an Amazon server farm. So the boards that are running product on a platform are less tolerant uh, to residues than other boards might be because they have a great deal of moisture around them to react with those residues. So if a, the, the frustrating part of parasitic leakage is the fact that the um, phenomenon is temporary. So imagine a board, uh, an instrument um, that has to be calibrated, a very sensitive measurement instrument that runs off of electronics uh, on this platform is malfunctioning. It won't calibrate. So they send it back to the manufacturer and the manufacturer inspects it in their climate-controlled, humidity-controlled environment, and they get a no-trouble-found um, response from their automated inspection. Um, we have an acronym for no-trouble-found, which is WTF, and normally in this environment when the customer insists something's wrong and the manufacturer cannot verify it, there's actually two sets of acronyms that are generally produced. One is NTF, uh, followed rather rapidly by WTF. Um, I'll let you all figure out what that is. Um, if you're in the test business, you already know. If you're in the electronic assembly industry, you already know. Um, so WTF, NTF, um, they can't duplicate the problem. Then the board is shipped back to the platform and the problem just comes right back again, which creates this very frustrating uh, cycle of uh, a failure. So everything in life, and, and in this illustration, in the electronic assembly industry, and more specifically in the world of ECM and reliability, is cause and effect. So the cause, moisture combined with electrical current combined with conductive residues, the effect, electrochemical migration. No current, no ECM. No residues, no ECM. No moisture, no ECM. Take any one of those out and... The problem goes away. So of the three elements which produce ECM, uh, moisture, current, and residues, as I said, any one of those removed from the equation will prevent the, uh, the onset of electrochemical migration. So uh, one um, common theory is to remove the moisture. And how do we remove moisture? Well, a lot of people, if this were a live event, hands would be going up and we say, you know, conformal coat the boards, um, which is wrong and right all in one. Um, conformal coating uh, is permeable. And, you know, the, the Webster's definition of permeable is allowing liquids or gases to pass through it. So the purpose of conformal coating is to prevent 
a failure if something like this happened. If an iPhone or an Android phone fell into a swimming pool or a toilet um, and the boards were conformally coded, then the board, the product would survive if it's, if it's removed from the uh, liquid in a, in a certain period of time. If I were to pour my, my water on my uh, MacBook Pro in front of me, uh, I would hope that the, the board right below the keys are, was conformally coded because it would survive. However, moisture will over time permeate through uh, the membrane of conformal coating and can react with anything below the conformal coating, any residues, conductive ionic residues below the conformal coating and produce an ECM event under the coating. Here's three examples of what I'm saying. Uh, our friends at Foresight provided these images for us. To the left is a component that has been conformally coated, and you can see a dendrite growing right on the surface underneath the coating. Now keep in mind, no moisture, no ECM, no, dendr no dendritic growth. So there has to be moisture underneath that coating in order for that dendrite to grow. We also see on the right upper um, photograph, of, we see an example of corrosion under conformal coating. Corrosion requires moisture, um, and that is under the conformal coating. And then finally, on the lower right photograph, we see uh, delamination of the, of the uh, conformal coating. And uh, that occurs uh, because of uh, bad adhesion. And bad adhesion reminds me of this guy. For those of you who are upwards in age like myself, uh, you'll remember this ad, Earl Scheib. I'll paint any car, any color for twenty nine ninety five. And how does he do that? He doesn't prep the surface, or he didn't prep the surface. It was just bring it in, spray paint over whatever is there, and don't worry if you don't like the color; it'll it'll peel off within a few months, and and you can go back to your original color. That's what happens if someone tries to conformal coat over residues. Uh, there's a a very high probability that uh, there will be uh, delamination of that, of that material, uh, as you can see in this photograph right here. So the best practice for conformal coating is to clean the assemblies prior to coating, which creates a circular reasoning. Circular reasoning works because circular reasoning works because, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so removing moisture, A, is not entirely possible, and B, in order to run the processes that would reduce the amount of moisture, one has to have a clean assembly. Um, so moisture re removal is not really the solution to prevent ECM in the long term. Um, removing the current obviously is not a good solution. It, it is effective. It is very effective. But then again, your customers are buying your product because they want them to do something. They don't want them to remain off. So that that really is a non-starter. The um, the best method, the most effective method for preventing any electrical chemical migration event uh, is to remove the ionic residues. Um, not even non-ionic non doesn't really matter. We don't care a whole lot about that, although when you remove ionic residues, you generally remove all residues. It's the ionic residues that we are um, highly concerned about. Now, the final, uh, the final ECM-related event that could lead to a failure is conductive anodic filament or as I like to say, conductive anodic filament failure, C-A-F-F. Um, this is not a cleaning issue. You cannot clean your way out of, uh, out of CAF. However, you can easily avoid CAF uh, through a number of uh, small steps or even sometimes just one step, uh, which is not all that costly in, in, uh, for most people. So CAF was first reported in 1976 by Bell Labs. I'd like to think this guy is the guy who worked there, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, I like to call CAF subterranean ECM, subterranean electrochemical migration, because it does not, unlike dendritic growth and parasitic leakage, uh, as I've described earlier, CAF does not occur on the surface of the board. It, recurs, it occurs within the layers of the board. So if we look at a... Uh, a multi-layer board. Uh, we have several different layers. There's prepregs. There's all sorts of uh, materials here, and they get pushed together in a hydraulic press, generally, uh, to form one substrate uh, with multiple layers. And uh, after the laminates are all squeezed together and and form one surface, um, most boards have 
uh, some degree of through holes or vias, uh, and they have to be drilled out. So, or tooling holes, whatever. So, the drilling process occurs, and it's possible during the drilling process to create a little bit of drilling damage, and that is uh, little cracks, little micro cracks um, emanating out from the from the through hole or from the via, uh, as a result of the either the drills being dull or too much pressure put on or um, other other uh, factors. And these other factors can include uh, inadequate resin flow or something that they call dry weave in the board fabrication business. If a board goes through multiple thermal excursions, um, that can exacerbate these micro cracks, make them bigger, um, and actually cause them to form in, in some cases. Either way, whether it's from drilling damage or dry weave or too many trips through an oven, uh, these little cracks can form, which are in on their own not an issue. Uh, they're they're kind of an inert uh, phenomenon. However, other parts of the uh, board fabrication process can exploit those micro cracks. So once we've the boards have been drilled out, these micro cracks have formed. What do we do with the holes? We plate them, and we in order to plate them, we put uh, plating solution in there. And sometimes that plating solution can exploit these micro cracks and get into the micro cracks and kind of fill the gap uh, with plating solution, which is highly conductive. Um, once the boards are fabricated and the uh, drilled and plated, they go to the assembler and they go to you guys and and you guys stuff them uh, with components and um, and then turn them on. And once they the boards are subjected to electrical current over time, we could get um, some some calf formations, filament formations, growing within these micro cracks uh, and causing shorts. Now, calf, um, the filaments on calf are very fine. Uh, they're not uh, heavy enough gauge to conduct a lot of current, um, but they do cause boards to malfunction, and that malfunction could be a battery drain. That malfunction could be a calibration error, a um, number of things like that. Sometimes they can actually short themselves out and and act like a fuse. And if that occurs, you may never know, um, or it may damage the board in the process. They they rarely uh, cause a fire or anything super dramatic because they just don't carry enough current. But they can take down a product uh, and cause it to not function properly. And once it forms, it cannot be repaired. You can't clean your way out of out of calf. That's just not possible because we can't reach the area of the board where the calf has uh, occurred. So what do we do? Um, well, fortunately, we can prevent the calf from forming. Uh, once it forms, it's too late, but we can prevent it from forming altogether. So calf occurs in two stages. Two things have to happen. Number one, there has to be a degradation of the resin glass interface, something micro cracks that we call micro cracks. Um, and then the calf forms the the filament forms so once we just get the micro cracks that's not fatal baking can prevent further damage because just like uh, ecm on the surface ecm within the layers requires the same ingredients it requires electrical current moisture and conductive uh, materials once the calf forms that's fatal throw away the board uh, unless it it burns itself out and doesn't grow back. Um, the board is pretty much toast once it does form. So let's look at what promotes uh, calf, the calf promoters. One is micro cracks, inadequate resin flow, dry weave, uh, drilling damage, multiple thermal excursions, that I, as I mentioned before. Um, let's look at uh, uh, conductive residues. Um, they're a reality. We, As long as we're going to plate the through holes, the vias, uh, we're going to have to use plating solutions, which will always be, at least in our lifetime, conductive materials. So that's kind of a reality. We can't we can't just not plate the 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 through holes um, because that would have a, a very significant knock on effect. Uh, voltage: the higher the voltage, the more calf potential. But I'm going to throw that into the reality mode. Um, I don't think you can go back and tell your designers to cut your voltage in half. It's the the voltage chosen for a particular application is to serve that application. So that's really a reality issue and not really a design issue. Hole-to-hole -hole spacing, I'm going to call that 
that's a design issue that can maybe be changed, but it also lands in the world of reality um, because component packages have fixed spacing, bottom terminated components, BGAs have fixed spacing between their conductors. Um, and if, if a thousand components have to be put into five square inches uh, of, of, of space, that is really going to land in the reality world more, more than the design world. But to some extent, one can design more spacing. To some extent, we're kind of stuck with what we have. Uh, materials are are a are, are a big one. That's where we can really um, make a change in in attracting a calf issue or repelling a calf issue. Um, robust resin systems and glass finish combinations appear to be the best possible candidates for improving the insulation resistance of the laminate. Um, whatever laminate material one chooses when making the board can affect the propensity of calf. Uh, dicey cured epoxy is better than phenolic cured uh, epoxy, cured epoxy for calf resistance. Calf preventative measures, if you want to really avoid the possibility of calf, um, via to via gap, more gap, less calf potential. Again, that, that may not be an available choice, uh, but if it is, uh, the greater the gap, the less calf potential. Um, the bias, the voltage on the board, the lower, lower the bias, the lower the calf potential. Again, may not be your choice. Laminate, uh, calf resistant materials reduce the risk of calf. There are all sorts of FR4 and other, um, laminate materials that are more calf resistant than others. Uh, talk to your board fabrication, uh, folks and see if there is, if you're concerned about calf, see if there is a, uh, material, uh, less uh, with less calf potential. Uh, cathodic vias have a lower calf potential versus anodic vias. Again, that may be a reality. It may be a, a choice. It's up to how your board is designed. Reflow profile, lower peak temperatures in uh, profiles, decrease calf potential. Um, again, that is probably not a design issue. That's probably a, a material selection uh, issue. And baking assemblies reduces the calf potential a lot. In, in many cases, it can prevent it. Although keep in mind, you can get all of the uh, moisture out of the assembly before you ship it uh, to your customer, depending where the board goes, where the product is, is, is operated, the climactic environment may reintroduce moisture back into the equation. Um, may not, just depends on a number of factors. Um, but certainly baking before um, shipping the product out uh, greatly reduces the propensity for calf. And when I say baking, most of the experts on calf uh, suggest two hours at 120 degrees C. IPC has a, uh, in, in the J standard 001 test method 650, 2.6.25 is a calf test. One can use the IPC specification to um, design an experiment to determine the propensity of calf on your particular assembly. That's a little bit of a, a crystal ball uh, that can see if your board is has a greater or lower propensity of calf. There are also third-party companies. We're not related to these companies, um, but I know I know them, and I know that they can perform these services uh, to, de to determine the propensity of calf based on your board design. You send them the Gerber files or other files, and they can actually tell you uh, the propensity of calf, uh, which is which may save um, may save a lot of money in the long run. Um, there's great materials available online. My, my favorite is this one, uh, conductive anodic filament failure and materials perspective. If you're concerned about CAF, uh, Google this document or email me after this presentation and I will be happy to send you a copy of this. Uh, and it, it's a good resource for looking ahead to see if you can engineer out CAF as a high potential and make it a very low potential, if, if a potential at all. So the cause of electrochemical migration on the surface is um, electrical current combined with conductive residues and moisture. The solution, remove the residues to prevent electrochemical migration, dendritic growth, and parasitic leakage. CAF has a very similar set of requirements and one extra. Um, CAF is caused by the mixture of electrical current, conductive residues, and moisture, just like on the surface. But CAF requires a pathway. On the surface, the whole surface is a pathway. Within the layers of the board, the pathway has to form in the form of uh, microcracks or something similar. So um, 
a very similar set of, of requirements plus pathway. Solution, eliminate the pathways. That's a material selection. There are, there are laminate materials that uh, will not crack under the same stresses that standard uh, F44 materials uh, might crack under. Eliminate calf res- uh, implement calf resistant designs. And number one, number one, remove moisture. Um, no moisture, no ECM of any sort. Uh, to clean or not to clean, as I would like to believe Shakespeare said, here's, you may not have to clean. I'm not saying everyone has to clean. Some people do, some people don't. Um, who are you uh, in, in that, uh, in that, that uh, consideration. Well, number one, know your product. That sounds very elementary, but know your product. Consider your circuit assembly's residue tolerance. Every assembly has a unique tolerance for residue. Some can tolerate a lot of residue. Some can tolerate very little, if any, residue. And what are the, re- what are the factors there? Well, consider your circuit assembly's climactic environment. Is it going to go into an Amazon server farm or is it going to go into a North Sea oil platform? Clearly, a board on an Amazon, in an Amazon server farm has a much greater tolerance for residue because it's going to see less moisture uh, than one on a North Sea oil platform. Um, People talk about harsh environments, safe environments. Um, They are really becoming more mixed and, and, you know, what is a harsh environment? Well, it's relative, as I would like to think Einstein would have said. It's completely relative. It depends on the residue tolerance of the assembly. So we look at um, illustrations like this as definitions of harsh environment, the poster child of harsh environment, an unpressurized part of, a, of an aircraft going from minus 50 to plus 100 uh, cycles, uh, uh, cycled many times a day, or a submarine, or a lighthouse, or uh, or a or a uh, satellite, or a oil platform, or a downhole, or whatever. Uh, those are all classic harsh environment scenarios. But for some assemblies, an office space could be considered a harsh environment. So consider the component spacing. The illustration above shows a through-hole component with relatively speaking, miles of, of, of space between conductors. The illustration below that is a very high density board. You can barely see the laminate material. It's all almost completely populated with, with, uh, components with conductors very, very close together. So the board above would have a much higher residue tolerance than the board below, which would have a very low residue tolerance. Consider the standoff height. Flux and other materials can be trapped underneath these bottom terminated components, uh, which may or may not be bad, depends on a number of other factors. But clearly, the amount of residue tolerance is lower on uh, the board with a number of bottom terminated components and and high density fine pitch components uh, compared to the um, large towering uh, cans with great spaces uh, down below. That board has a much higher um, propensity for residues uh, without creating an ECM event. And most importantly, consider what the cost of failure is. In some cases, the the failure is planned, planned obsolescence. That is a legitimate uh, strategy of of design. Um, But look at the cost of failure. This electronic flea collar does have a cost of failure. If it fails, we have one itchy dog. If the implantable defibrillator or pacemaker fails, we may have a different cost of failure, which is a trip in in an ambulance or or worse. Um, so each of these products have a completely different cost of failure. So one would say the concern over residue and the ECM related uh, symptoms of residues may be greater on the pacemaker than it would be on the electronic flea collar. So know your product, know what its residue tolerance is, consider its end use climactic environment, where is it going, consider its cost of failure, itchy dog or trip in an ambulance, consider its component density, consider its component standoff height, know how clean is clean enough. Now, I don't have slides on this, but uh, we will be in one of the uh, upcoming podcasts, a Reliability Matters podcast, uh, we will be discussing the new IPC cleanliness testing standards, um, uh, particularly relevant to rose testing. Rose testing was has been for the last 50 years the go-to for determining how clean is clean. 
However, it doesn't determine how clean is clean enough. Um, the, the number assigned to rose testing results was 10 micrograms of sodium equivalent per square inch or 1.56 per um, centimeter squared. And those numbers were established in the 1970s when pretty much every board, well, I think all boards back then were through hole with a high level of residue tolerance. Today, with miniaturization and, and the examples that I've shown earlier of lower residue tolerance designs, uh, that number is no good anymore. So the test is good, just the number is good. So really, it, it's how clean is clean enough. IPC, IPC's new um, J standard on cleaning now allows the user to come up with um, objective evidence. So you can design whatever test you want, or you can use a pre-existing rose tester or whatever, and you can use that. You just have to show that the numbers that your test or the rose test is producing result in a uh, board with a high degree of reliability. And you have to show that those numbers mean something. So um, we throw away the old numbers and we adopt new numbers based on objective evidence. And we're going to get into that in another webinar. Uh, probably our next webinar will be that uh, next month. And uh, we'll also do that in a podcast. So stay tuned. In the world of, in the world of Internet of Things, wearables, Industry 4.0, the move to lead-free, the move to no-clean, the move to high-density, uh, super miniaturization, very low standoff heights, and increased quality expectations. Um, we have propelled um, electrical devices into environments where they were not normally found. Uh, and, you know, we're putting... Um, smart meters on helms, and these smart meters are located outside. Uh, we are putting electronics in refrigerators. We're putting cameras and Wi-Fi devices in refrigerators to make them connected. We're putting um, connected uh, technology in toothbrushes, in in uh, prescription lids uh, to know how many times uh, the prescription bottle was open, be able to track that remotely. We're putting these devices into footballs and, and tennis rackets and basketballs. And, and, and we are taking products that had not normally been associated with electronics and putting electronics in there and then throwing them out into all sorts of environments, um, environments with uh, weather for the smart meter, environments with cold and, and moisture in the case of refrigerators, um, environments with moisture and shock in the case of toothbrushes and shock in the case of football uh, and tennis and basketball. And, and we are expecting these products to operate uh, without fail in an environment where we've not had that experience before. Um, you know, I just think of, we just had the Super Bowl the other day and I'm, I'm thinking of these RFID, not RFID, but these little transmitters that they're putting inside footballs um, and for reasons I don't understand, but, uh, but they are. And, and football is, you know, the kind of the definition of harsh environment um, in terms of shock and in terms of, of moisture and heat and cold and, and generally not heat, but certainly cold. Um, and these devices have to operate. I don't know what the cost of failure is. It may be rather low, but certainly um, reputation is a cost, and mo most people don't want their products to fail, even if they don't cause a lot of damage. When we look at at uh, automotive electronics, you know, we are we are driving a computer that happens to be mounted on a car, and and a lot of the of the electronics we're putting into cars are not just infotainment, but they are actually designed to keep us safe. Um, so if we're driving a Tesla in, you know, with autopilot turned on, we need to know that the electronic assemblies in this car, um, which can go in and out of harsh environments, be subject to vibration and cold and moisture and heat, um, are reliable because our life could depend on it. I have a couple of cars. My, my weekend car is this 1968 Mustang. It has one set of electronics in it, and that is in the AM transistor radio that's built into the dash. Um, that's pretty much the only electronics in the car. There's electrical systems in the car, but if, but if my electronics fail, I can't listen to AM radio. That is the worst thing that will happen to me. I also have another car that is completely glass cockpit and high-tech. It has um, adaptive cruise control. It will turn my steering wheel and park for me if I want it to park for me, parallel park, for example. It will 
bump me into the center of my lane. It'll actually grab my wheel and, and turn it to keep me from drifting out of a lane. Um, there's a lot of electronics in that car that are designed to keep me safe. And if they fail, they could hurt me or worse. So, you know, the standard is very high on reliability when it comes to circuit assemblies, particularly uh, exaggerated when it, when they're put into harsh environments. So, so reliability really does matter in these cases. And we can increase the reliability by simply removing the residues and eliminating one um, potential cause of, of failure. So harsh environment, safe environment, they're, they're becoming blurred lines. Um, it really depends upon the assembly's um, ability to withstand uh, residues and and um, and their cost of failure. So finally, last few slides. Thanks for sticking with me. Finally, if you've been on my presentations before, I always end with this because this just remains my favorite uh, anecdote. We have a customer who manufactures high-end um, uh, equipment for the music industry, amplifiers and speakers and all sorts of stuff. And um, they, as they've been around for a long time, and as they went from uh, tubes to solid state, from through hole to surface mount, uh, they began to notice a degradation in the quality of the sound coming out of their, of their um, speakers. And, uh, they had a feeling that it had to do with um, contamination on the assembly, which it did. So they sent us uh, boards to to uh, clean, and we offered to provide cleanliness testing to quantify the amount of contaminant before and after, uh, which is normally uh, desired. In their case, though, they didn't really care about what the number said. Uh, they were ahead of their time, actually. They didn't care about what the number said. They wanted to know if they remove residue, what does the quality of the sound sound like? So their version of cleanliness testing was this. They basically brought a bunch of musicians in a, in a, in a sound uh, booth and, and jammed for a while. And they listened to the quality of the sound coming out of their speakers. And they could determine how clean the board was uh, by the quality of the sound uh, being produced through those boards. And that is what I like to call their sound of clean. So in the world of risk, uh, reliability associated with risk, we have several choices. We can reduce the risk. We can transfer the risk. We typically transfer the risk when we send a product to a contract manufacturer and say, this is your problem. You need to build this right. We can accept the risk and just say, okay, that's just part of business. Maybe planned obsolescence would be a good acceptance risk policy. Or we can avoid the risk. And my, my uh, proposition is to avoid the risk, eliminate the risk, just eliminate one of the three variables that produces that risk either electrical current or moisture or residues and residues of course is the is makes the most sense out of those three if you remove the residues you remove the risk there may be a thousand other things that kill that board but it won't be electrical chemical migration you can take that off the table if the residues are removed the ionic residues are removed so to finalize know your product know its residue tolerance know its end-use climactic environment, know its cost of failure, and know how clean is clean enough. In other words, know your sound of clean. So whether it comes to harsh environments or safe environments, clean matters. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to Reliability Matters. If you like what you hear, please be sure to give us a like. Just click the like or heart button below. If there are any reliability-based questions you'd like to have answered or specific topics discussed, let me know. I can be reached at mike at mikeconrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on iTunes or follow us on Spotify. You can also listen to us on iTunes, Spotify, aqueoustech.com, pcbchat.com, spreaker.com, or our newest affiliate, Ascendo Reliability, on reliability.fm, a site dedicated to all things reliability. Once again, thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with another episode of Reliability Matters. In the meantime, keep doing it right.